think we'll start. So um, my name is Paul Collegia. I'm the Director of Research Computing at Cambridge University. And today we're going to talk to you about um, our attempts to start using OpenStack in research computing, and specifically a biomedical platform that uh, we're building currently. Well, I can't look at the audience. I'm getting blinded by these lights. So this talk is uh, going to be in two halves. It's myself and my lead engineer, uh, Wojciech Czurek. So the first half is going to be more of an overview. Uh, an overview about what we do at Cambridge, an overview about HPC and the MindBed Cloud, and then Wojtek will give a more engineering-focused talk, giving some details of the implementation and some recent uh, examples of trying to connect storage within a research cloud. So just some history. I, I think it actually does say in my contract that whenever I give a talk, I have to talk about Cambridge's history. Uh, it's almost de facto. My boss will be watching. So uh, we have a long history of computing development at Cambridge right back to the late 40s with a, an interesting system called EDSAC right up to the modern day here of the OpenStack. So EDSAC was a very interesting system and that's Morris Wilkes there. He's quite, quite famous. And look how engineers used to dress in the 40s. My engineers do not dress like this today. And this was a very interesting computer system. It was the first computer with electronic load store memory. It was mercury delay tubes, and that's the, mat of, the vat of mercury there that they're both staring into. Okay. This was actually a very interesting system. Atlas was, was the fastest supercomputer in the UK was, uh, was in Cambridge in the 60s, and this is our machine room today, much more boring looking commodity machine room. But, uh, even a Raspberry Pi, of course, came to Cambridge. And you can do clustering with a Raspberry Pi. This was built by a colleague of mine in Southampton by his son, a Lego Raspberry Pi system. I was quite annoyed when he beat me to the pip with that PR. He got lots of press for doing that. I was actually quite pissed that he beat me to it. Anyway. So Cambridge is an interesting uh, location. It's really a global tech center. The university itself has a turnover of around 1.2 billion pounds. We have a research budget of 500 million, which is one of the largest research budgets in the UK. But I think more interesting than the university is a tech cluster. So Cambridge has a really active technology center. There's 1,500 technology companies in Cambridge with an annual turnover of around 12 billion pounds employing 53,000 staff. That's why it's really difficult to get good engineers in Cambridge because they're all working here, earning much more money than I can pay them. So we just have to make things interesting for our engineers. It's the only way we can keep them working. And we have a mandate by the university to provide research computing services to the university and the technology cluster. The, the university really does like to foster uh, and, and assist this technology cluster. It's an integral part of the city and we now have a mandate to provide services to that technology cluster as well. So if I look at the focus areas of my division, we really obviously support research in the university. That's our primary function. We have a strong industrial outreach function where we try to uh, project services to UK industry. And we have a quite an active kind of solution development uh, function. And this is all aimed at obviously driving discovery impact and innovation. This is the agenda of the university as a whole, and we, we have that agenda. So the research computing team is structured across uh, six divisions, and we have 28 FTEs in, in those six internal divisions. Okay. So just a quick uh, slide on, on outputs and usage. So we support 700 uh, active users. I think we have 1,000 registered users, but a lot of those have kind of retired or died or realized they logged on to the wrong system. So we have 700 people that actually use us actively across 42 departments. And our systems are around 80% utilized constantly. And that's quite a high utilization especially when you have large parallel jobs and, and you're waiting for systems to drain to give access to large parallel jobs. So this is, we, we're really pleased with that kind of average utilization. Very interesting demographic has appeared over the last five years. We're seeing this emergence of what we call the long tail. So it's kind of an HPC center director's dirty secret, really, that in the past, 
95% of your usage was by 5% of your users. That's not a good statistic when you try to get money from either your university or central government. They don't like that stat. So we don't normally talk about it. But over the last five years, things have changed, and we can talk about this now. Those 5% are still there, but they only consume around 50% of my resources. The other 50% uh, are consumed by a much larger number of smaller users. Oops. This thing's got a hair, hairline trigger. Um, so we have around 300 users who are consuming this kind of level. If, if I say core hours, my boss doesn't understand it. He doesn't know what a core hour is. So I, 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 I give him this number of workstation days. He gets that, right? Workstation day, he understands. 200,000 core hours, he's got no idea what I'm talking about. So uh, this is a boss slide when I try to justify my existence, when I want to pay rise, I bring out this slide. It kind of works. So 200 workstation days in the last 12 months. This is quite a nice figure. So ever since we started nine years ago, we've had this kind of compound annual growth rate of, of new users on the system. And that's been a constant growth at that rate every year for nine years. And I think when we move to a more open way of accessing the system, models we can employ with OpenStack, I think that, use, that growth rate will go up. And I think this is the most important point on the slide when you're trying to get money out of the university. We're currently supporting 253 million pounds worth of research projects. So when you look at all those user groups, and I ask them, you know, what's the value of the grants that we're supporting? And I add it all up, it comes to that number, which is 17% of our university's income. And so this, this is quite a, a, a nice number when I try to get the university to fund me, that we support a lot more research than, than we cost. And over the last nine years, we've supported 1,400 publications. It's so about 300 publications a year are produced out of work that gets done on the central systems. Again, that's a nice number to, to give to your boss's boss. So just a quick talk about infrastructure. I'm an HPC guy, and we love infrastructure. I know I'm at a software conference, but HPC guys love, love infrastructure. OK, so uh, we managed to convince the university to invest in a new data center. Uh, this is the HPC hall. We have around 100 cabinets in the HPC hall, 2 megawatts of IT load. The cooling is quite interesting. You can't see it here, but we have water-cooled back doors. And so the PUE of this data center is 1.1, which, which means we only consume 10% of the energy that goes into the computing to cool it. Most kind of non-optimized data centers, even today, are running at PUEs of 2. So they, they, they cost the same amount of energy you put in to call them. 1.1 is a, is, a, is a really nice number. Because electricity in the UK is expensive, right? So you guys here are paying, what, 7 cents a unit, 8 cents a unit. In, in, in the UK, we're, we're spending 18 cents a unit. Yeah, so power is really expensive in Europe. So our, our current platforms, we, we have around 900 Dell servers in, in, a, in, a, in a few different systems, a large Intel x86 cluster with infinity band, a large GPU cluster. These are all quite large systems, reaching quite nice numbers in the top 500. The top 500 is kind of like a, a league table of supercomputers. HPC guys love to compete in that league table to get higher up the list. This, no, this machine was number 93 when it entered that list in, 200 and, uh, in 2012. The GPU cluster was particularly interesting because it was very energy efficient. There's another league table for energy efficient machines, and this reached number two in that list. I'm going to start to click through. This year is going to be an interesting year. There's a lot of new platforms. The Biomed Cloud, I'm going to talk about a large upgrade to our central cluster. There'll be a thousand nodes of, uh, of Intel uh, Broadwell. A lot of work going on in storage. We're, we're really seeing an explosion of, of data science at the university. This is, this is echoed in, in every university. Computation has really now moved on to data, and most of our ways of dealing with data were not keeping up with demand. So we've had to completely restructure the way we store data, moving to a kind of hierarchical system to, uh, to keep that under control. So let's get on to, to, to OpenStack. Why, why do OpenStack? You know, why, why am I here? Why am I not enjoying my time in Cambridge? So from my perspective, from a central IT person's perspective, there are strong drivers, okay? We, we wish to make computing and data 
and applications and workflows a lot more accessible, a lot more flexible, and more secure. I don't want to be relying on Linux permissions to keep my biomedical data in the data center, and not on some undergraduate's desk. Right? We, we, we need better security models. Also, I don't want to keep having to, to have a range of different frameworks for all the IT I do. I don't have to keep employing specialist engineers like this one. <laughs> I mean, this one's okay, but you know, it's difficult to find them and keep them and nurture them. I would much rather be getting my engineers from a wider engineering base. So, you know, I, I have drivers. And OpenStack possibly allows me to have a single framework to offer a lot of different IT services from, and I'm, I'm drawing on a wider engineering base to do that. Okay, that's my driver. But what about my customer's drivers? What does this guy want? Yeah, I don't know what this guy wants, actually. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is a strange guy, but my customers are strange guys. That's the problem. Yeah, I, can, I can really happily say that my customers are strange people. This is videoed as well, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> My customers are great people. I love them. So uh, what does he want? So he wants, re he wants computing to be easier. He wants to be able to share his computational models, his methods, his data. And basically all he wants is to decrease the time to science and increase innovation and increase research outputs. It's quite easy, actually. He doesn't, he doesn't want much. Easier computing. Reduce time to science. That's really what it's about. So what are we doing in Cambridge in, in terms of OpenStack? So I think there's, there's two main focuses for us. Um, we're looking at kind of development and deployment of OpenStack in a, in a broad range of research computing use cases. And I'll, I'll talk about those, those broad range of, of different use cases in the next few slides. And we have a particular focus on biomedical computing. We're also involved in a, in a very large astronomy project called the Square Kilometre Array. This is one of the next very large-scale big data, big science projects. Uh, all the computational design for that project is headed up by Professor Paul Alexander in the astronomy department, astrophysics department in Cambridge. And we've been contracted by Paul to look at certain aspects of the computer design. And uh, we're looking to use OpenStack for the base control and monitoring system within uh, that radio telescope. Basically, radio telescopes do big Fourier transforms, but very big Fourier transforms. So we, you know, we need uh, uh, when this, when the first phase of the SKA comes online in 2020, which is 10% of the experiment, we need a 300 petaflop Fourier transform machine, and we wish that machine to be running OpenStack. So this is, you know, tens of thousands of nodes uh, running OpenStack, and we're in the design phase of that. And we have a good partnership of companies that we're working with at the moment. So Dell, Intel, Red Hat, Mellanox, Next Center, a Stack HPC, which is a specialist company in the UK looking at this convergence of um, OpenStack and research computing. And, and, and last but not least, it's this emerging community that is here in this room. I think, I think the people in this room are going to make this fly or not. And, and I think for, for OpenStack and scientific computing to, to flourish, that will only happen if the community get organized and, and, and pull together. And, and I see that happening here at this show. It, it's very encouraging. So use cases. So I thought I'd just spend some time looking at use cases for, um, for OpenStack within the research computing domain. And the first two are, are really when I put my service provider hat on and we want to provide infrastructure and platform as a service for researchers that have kind of persistent research computing needs. So this is not kind of scientific workloads, it's for that web server or that persistent uh, infrastructure in the department or in the research group. They'd normally go out and buy a, a beige box and keep it for 15 years. I do have customers that have 15-year-old equipment in their machine room, and then they want to give, to give it to me to put it in my machine room. Right? We say, no, that should go in landfill. So this stops that. This, this helps us get rid of all that old crap from my customers' machine rooms and get them running on a virtualized infrastructure. Okay, that's one and two. Three really is kind of chameleon-like. This idea of having application development provided as a, as a service from the center is a really good idea. And I shamelessly copied this idea from Chameleon because it's a really good one. Okay. Um, 
here we've got kind of research computing as a service, VMs as a service for researchers to attack that long tail, to make you know, uh, VMs accessible uh, for sharing workflows. Really like the, the Jetstream scenario. Okay, so Jetstream does this really well. And HPC as a service, the last talk was about that, the, the guys at Monash are doing this. This is where you run your HPC systems within a virtualized environment. And the sixth use case is uh, data. So da data, I think, is one of the, the, the really interesting scenarios here, where you might have a large public data set. You don't want to be dragging that data all around the country to the different researchers. You want to bring the researchers to the data. But then they complain that the environment's not right. So virtualization gives you the chance to bring the people to the data and give them their own environment when they get there. I think you know, we, we really are moving to data-driven science. And I think that OpenStack and virtualization really has a huge part to play in enabling data-driven science and letting people bring their own environments to the data. So let's talk about the, the biomedical cloud. This is the new system that we're building now. Actually, we're not building it now because the guy that's building it is sitting there. And actually, I've got an email waiting for you because the customer's now noticed that you're not there. And he's saying, where's my system? So uh, as soon as we get back to England, Vitek is building that system. So what does Biomed Cloud actually do? It really is, it, it's designed to be a single compute and data platform to link different research communities at the university together. So it, it, it links academic researchers and their data to clinical researchers and their data. And it also brings in uh, more sensitive data from the hospital. It brings in medical records, it brings in live telemetry feeds from the hospital. And we wanted to drive research outputs in the clinical domain, uh, to drive research outputs within the, the academic domain, and hopefully to translate some of these methodologies back into patient care in the hospital. So th this is what we call translational medicine. And I've got a slide on this. So, so, so really what we're trying to do, BioCloud will enable this kind of virtual circle where we take patient data, we drive that into research programs in the university, that gets fed into clinical trials and under the correct kind of ethics goes into to patient care. Yeah, where we translate those outputs into new treatments. But you can only undertake that translation if you have this virtual circle. Yeah. Uh, and cloud infrastructures really can help this process. So what, what does the biomedical cloud look like? This is my kind of noddy cartoon that I drew up. Boitek is now laughing at me because it has no wires in it. But this is, this is what I think it is from a director's point of view. So we have storage that sits in the NHS, that's our, our hospital structure. It sits on the NHS secure network. We then take data warehouse products out into our secure storage location in our research network and under the right ethical and compliance regime we can let research staff get their hands on that data and undertake research programs. And so we have 10 petabytes of luster uh, so we, we, from the HPC space, people are used to using large parallel file systems. There's two petabytes of Next Center Store, which is a more enterprise type uh, storage uh, system. Next Center Edge, which gives us our block, and a large tape. This, this allows us to actually have quite uh, well-enforced policies of, of, of stopping these file systems clogging up. So we have a, a hierarchical storage system and an HSM to move data continually onto the tape. So it's not all OpenStack at the moment. The only OpenStack component within the uh, system is 2,000 cores. There's a traditional 2,000 cores of traditional HPC and a Hadoop cluster. We do plan as we get more experience and we've tested more ways of working to put all of this within an OpenStack framework. So why, do, why are we doing this? What, what, what are our drivers? There are three stakeholder projects. So the funding for this was just over $3 million and that came from three uh, lead uh, projects. The first one is a genomics project. So, so we have a, a contracted relationship with a, a company called Genomics England. This is a public company. It's, it's fully owned by our National Health Service and it's tasked with sequencing uh, 100,000 patients with rare diseases 
and my team are writing the software stack for this, which will do that gene variant analysis uh, component. And this, this software really offers quite breakthrough functionality and performance because traditional methods just don't scale to, to, to that size. And we will deploy this software on our own infrastructure, not to feed Genomics England, to, but to feed a similar project that we're helping in, in the university called the Bridge Project, which has to sequence 10,000 uh, disease patients. That will feed into Genomics England. And we're already working quite closely with that group on their pipelines and uh, helping them run within the Biomed platform. So this is a very similar use case to what was just discussed by, by Monash. Uh, and we will be shamelessly uh, having some support from our Monash colleagues who are kind of ahead of the curve. So we have a large kind of imaging, microscopy and structural determination groups in, in the university. So medical imaging where, you know, brain scans and various other scans. Uh, microscopy, so this is apparently a microscope. I used to be a microbiologist and I never saw a microscope like that. This is apparently how microscopes look today. This is kind of really funky stuff. Right, so these microscopes produce an awful amount of data, loads of images at really high, high throughput. This is for structural determination. So a lot of computational biology relies on structures of molecules that are traditionally produced by X-ray crystallography where you crystallize your sample. Biological samples of interest do not crystallize, so you're kind of stuck. And so this method doesn't crystallize, it, it freezes them and then puts them in an electron microscope and you can get very good resolution. This, this whole industry has gone through a real revolution just, just recently and again produces a lot of data at the end point and needs a lot of computation in the middle. So all these industries are transforming biology and medicine and they can't work the way they used to. They need high performance computing resources and our industry does not serve them well by traditional methods. So we need to use new methods of uh, providing them with computer and data resources. And the chaps in Monash have been doing this very well. And uh, why invent the will? So the last area that, that we're going to look at is predictive medical informatics. This one I find personally really interesting. And there's a lot of low-hanging fruit here. So we can um, work with the hospital. And uh, you can take medical records, patient records. You take live telemetry feeds from the hospital, you know, people's blood pressure and various other stats. And you run quite simple statistical models on that data and you can you can come up with some really interesting predictive uh, statistics that can really uh, improve patient health and this is a really good example so this chap here John Cromwell he's from Iowa I met him at Dell World last year has a statistical model he takes live feeds from the operating theater he combines that with medical records and he can predict during the operation whether the patient is likely to get a post-op infection and they change the procedure and by doing that, they can cut the post-operative infection rate by 58%. That, that's kind of cool. And there's loads of things you can do like that if you set up the infrastructure and you have the statistical models. Okay, and I think that's my part of the talk done. I'll now hand you over to this chap. <laughs> actually, what it's quite a good, it's actually quite a good likeness. <laughs> I try my best. Good um, afternoon. My name is Wojciech Turek. I work for Paul. <laughs> um, I'm leading a team of uh, research computing platforms. So in practice, that means actually I have to design, build, and then make it work whatever Paul's dreams up. Um, but we basically are driven to deliver cutting edge and, uh, and, and high quality technology to our researchers, to drive research at the University of Cambridge. Um, so I'd like to mention my colleagues who contributed into, into uh, a talk and, and some data in, in the slides. So, uh, so Stig Telfer, I think everyone knows Stig. Um, he works uh, with the university. He's uh, our OpenStack consultant and he's the driving force behind our OpenStack efforts. Um, and Matt, uh, so Matt is uh, our HPC specialist. And he's done a lot of work around benchmarking and building a, a storage platform, which we're planning to use with OpenStack. I would like to also mention our um, partners. Um, 
So we teamed up with very good uh, vendors uh, to deliver um, high quality and, and production open stack system. Um, so the key char characteristics for our um, open stack biome biomedical cloud, um, we actually at the university we have a, um, a site license for a Red Hat Infrastructure site license. So um, it was natural for us to get um, advantage of that, and um, our production uh, uh, OpenStack platform is based on the Red Hat OpenStack platform. Um, that gives us a, a very good automation management and also um, some control over the updates. Um, I think these things get better as, as OpenStack is released. Um, so every new release has, has better way of updating, upgrading its components which is very important for production system because obviously we, we, we don't want to have a, a downtime of uh, three or four days um, when we're upgrading our OpenStack system. Um, and um, we obviously, uh, because it's a production system, we would like to uh, have a high ability. So uh, we utilize a pacemaker uh, HA proxy and uh, other techniques uh, like Galera for, for database uh, replication. Um, we also are uh, looking at the different types of storage. Uh, so uh, bioinformatics uh, is, requires a, a decent storage to, 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 to look at the data. It's, it's a lot of data, so, so delivering a high performance storage uh, to the compute nodes is, is a key a component of, of that platform. So we look at different storage systems. Um, so our Cinder uh, will have multiple backends um, for different functions. Um, and to deliver that storage, we obviously need to have high performance network. Um, so we um, use a um, uh, Marinox um, network, uh, which is the same as we do for HPC. So our HPC runs Infinity Band. Um, here we use uh, Mellanox Ethernet. Uh, but we, uh, it, this network uh, delivers capabilities such, uh, such as RDMA, which can accelerate your storage. Uh, so you've probably seen that slide many, many times today. Um, so this is a reference architecture for, for our OpenStack. Uh, it's Red Hat based. Um, uh, it has the undercloud component, uh, which manages and deploys the, the, cloud, the uh, overcloud components. Uh, we've got compute nodes, um, uh, multiple controller nodes to provide HA, and then uh, uh, multiple Cinder backends. And um, we, as Paul mentioned, uh, we, we would like to deliver uh, a stable, and secure platform, so um, we isolate all the all the networks, and uh, also we w because of the performance, we would like to, we isolate the storage network from the other networks as well. Um, so this is actually um, if if you've seen the London Underground map, so this is based on the London uh, Tube map. This is actually showing uh, University of Cambridge network. Um, why is this important? Um, so this little circle here is our data center um, where the main part of the platform will be uh, located. And uh, all these little points are different uh, departments, colleges. Um, so University of Cambridge is spread across the whole town. And we actually own the network. So we run our own fibers. Um, and um, we, uh, we, we can connect different parts of the university directly with dark fibers and, and enjoy very high performance connections. And at, at this end here, we have a hospital. Um, and it's, it's one of the biggest uh, research hospitals in the UK. Um, so uh, you can see we have also diverse connections to the data, data center in the hospital. So we can provide a highly available uh, uh, network connection to, to our customers. Uh, and and uh, hospital 
um, who have devices like uh, PET scanners and, and gene sequencers, uh, they produce the data and they have to shift the data to the data center. So we have that infrastructure in place and it's very good. And this is actually thanks to our network team uh, that runs it, um, so, so they're, they're doing a very good job. Um, so this is actually um, how uh, our, it's a high level physical uh, uh, view on our uh, OpenStack system and how that connects to other elements in the data center. Um, so uh, that green square is, is um, uh, a rock, represents a rock, and uh, that element here is our availability zone in OpenStack. And uh, we got three similar uh, blocks like that. And uh, you can see, uh, probably can't read because it's a very small font, but this is a, a one gig network for management and uh, um, IPMI side racks. Then we've got um, a 50 gig connections to our compute and storage. And then we have 10 gig connection as well. And that to also to our compute. And that is uh, to, to, we will utilize that for um, external networks will provide the networks and, that, uh, and access to, uh, to departments. Um, so these two blocks, they're actually physically located in, the, in our data center. And our, our, our main data center is um, world-class data center. It's been built last year. And it has capacity of 200 racks and three megawatts uh, and plus one. So it's a very good data center. Um, I think uh, a big disaster would have to happen to actually data, data center down. Um, but we actually are not very far from the airport, so everything, uh, anything may happen. Um, so that, for that reason, um, we deployed a part of the open stack in the, in the second location, which is a smaller uh, server room. I, I wouldn't call it a data center. Um, and we also have, in the main data center, we also have our HPC um, cluster and HPC storage and a, a tape library um, for archiving. Um, and uh, these two locations are connected via the, the dark fibers that uh, were shown on the slide before. Um, so we have a two times 40 gig connection. Um, so my Linux have this long haul uh, transceivers for 40 gig um, uh, switches. Um, so we, we, we have pretty decent uh, bandwidth across the sites. And, uh, we, 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 have, um, we divide that uh, link for different functions. So this is a fu function for the OpenStack. We also have a function for the tape library um, and, and other components. Um, so we designed it as well in a way of thinking about um, that we may in the in, in maybe future we would like to uh, take uh, one of these um, blocks down and maybe uh, do something different with it. Maybe run ironic or metal or maybe the, uh, change the hardware, so in a way they're very, they, they, uh, the same. So we can actually migrate VMs to, to one of these and then that can be disconnected and, and, and changed and then we can bring it back, maybe even with a different version of OpenStack. So it's, it's quite flexible uh, design in that terms. Um, our storage um, is also distributed across multiple sites. So we've got um, our uh, block storage is, uh, we've got uh, one in the, in the main data center and, and another one um, in, um, in the second location. And we also have a, a, a tape system in the second location for the archive. Um, so a little bit about the hardware. Um, so as you can see, actually it's not that bad. I'm not here, but actually things happening there and um, people put cables into servers and switches. Um, so don't worry, Paul. <laughs> um, so the, the hardware, uh, we, we, our uh, compute nodes are, um, actually this is, uh, should be different. The actually compute nodes are here, uh, C6320s, which are a dense Dell servers, uh, four servers per 2U. So you can see them here. So there's lots of cabling in there. Again, you will see the server. Um, it's quite neat cabling though. Um, um, so yes, we try to utilize space as, as much as we can. Uh, because space is precious in the data center, and we're running out of that space because we've lots of systems. 
Um, so you can see here uh, the, the, the one gig network and the uh, 50 and 10 gig network here. And this is the one uh, part of the control plane. So we've got a controller node here and, and then uh, some of the uh, object and block storage. And essentially, this, that's one of the green blocks that I showed you on the slide before. Um, so we also we, we, we use an Accenta uh, um, storage. We've got an Accenta edge and Accenta store. And um, our network is, as I mentioned before, is Mayanox. So the, the core network is 100 gigabit network. And uh, we also have, uh, so this is actually the new spectrum switches, uh, which uh, uh, will, uh, they, they have, uh, they have uh, capability of uh, offloading certain uh, functions. Um, so in the future, they will have capability of offloading VXLAN, to, and uh, you can be able to do VXLAN on the switch, which will enable us to redesign our network. So at the moment, this is all, uh, this L2 network. Um, and obviously, for, for scalability, would like to have uh, L2 inside the racks and then have L3 um, above the racks, and that will be possible uh, with high performance uh, VXLANs uh, when uh, when when Mayanox actually brings that function online on the switches. Uh, and they, I, for what I hear, they're working very hard to make that happen as soon as possible, which is great. Um, So we also have a development platform. So this is actually Stig's playground, um, and uh, it actually it's 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 uh, essentially in the scaled down uh, version of the of the production system. So we use pretty much the same hardware, which is obviously the key thing because you want to test this hardware. We want we want to bring the new features, uh, the new firmwares uh, online on the development system and then test it. It's a best practice. We don't want to disturb the production system in any way. Um, so one of the things we're doing now with this is we actually we're deploying um, this generic um, storage device. This is actually a server with 24 SSDs uh, in RAID 10, and we've got a J, actually not J, but it's a it's a Dell MD3460 storage uh, with 80 annealing SAS disk attached to it, and uh, we. Uh, uh, exporting that to our compute nodes using ICER protocol. So this is uh, like a SCSI, but with RDMA acceleration. So everyone says this is great because that is high performance, you know, high throughput, high latency. At least that's what you read in the Marinox uh, um, PR. So we decided to test it ourselves. And uh, my colleague, Matt, spent quite a lot of time in the last few days to to, to do some tests, and uh, we've got some benchmarks done. Uh, we use FIO, which is quite a popular benchmark. Um, so the other department just did the benchmark for, on the, for the SSDs because they're more interesting, really. Um, so as you can see, the system has 24 SSDs, Intel SSDs. Um, the, the server is quite powerful as well. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, throughput, we we see really big difference so on this graph. The bigger is better, so we can see uh, uh, more than five gigabytes a second for write, and then uh, for read, and then uh, slightly over four gigabytes a second for writes. And this is a uh, normalized SCSI, so it's a huge difference. Um, in IOPS, this is a similar story. Um, bigger is better, so we 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 getting. Uh, Almost uh, just below 600,000 IOPS for reads and uh, 500,000 500, IOPS for uh, writes, and then iSCSI is is not doing that well. Um, so obviously there is a big advantage of uh, the RDMA acceleration, and this is uh, also very important a latency. Um, so huge numbers. This is actually logarithmic scale, so you can see uh, uh, here. Actually, the lower is better. Um, so there is a big difference between uh, iSCSI and ICER in terms of latency as well. So it's winning on throughput 
and IOPS and latency. And, and I think what's, what's really cute about this is that, that um, this is a, a very cost-effective way of delivering a flexible um, and high-performance uh, storage and in, 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 uh, in, in a very um, flexible way to, to your compute. And that, that can work well in not a typical HPC application or in OpenStack. So these tests were, were done on bare metal, so we haven't done the test yet on the, on the Nova uh, compute node. So this is the next stage. We'll be uh, publishing these uh, tests. Um, actually, part of the work we're doing here is, is to, to design the reference architecture for this uh, storage system, then run benchmark, so validate that what the vendors actually says is, is actually true. And, and then uh, publish them. So part of the scientific work group, which uh, um, had, had an inauguration in, in this summit, um, is to make sure that all these outputs they captured and, and that everyone can uh, find them and, and make use of them so that work is not lost and, and, and that we actually p progress things. Um, so this is some of the future work, which is uh, interesting for, uh, for for biomedical applications, but not only. So my HPC background is, is storage, and we're running a big cluster systems, uh, more than five petabytes. Um, and um, we would like to obviously take advantage of, 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 of these existing systems. So um, uh, there is actually uh, around three use models for, for, for Luster in OpenStack, and one of them is, is to enable the existing uh, Luster for system to, to, be, to, be, to, be, uh, to use in the uh, OpenStack. And um, use, the, use Luster as a shared storage backend uh, for, through services like Manila, or de deploy Luster as a service, so just deploy entire file system within the tenant environment. Um, just to provide high performance and high throughput shared storage within that tenant environment. Um, but there are challenges with, with Luster, and we, we've been discussing this during uh, meet, meetups uh, on Monday. And uh, to make actually Luster a, a, a true multi tenant uh, file system, there are numbers of things that have to happen. Uh, uh, we need to implement a mapping feature for the uh, UIDs and GIDs and um, enable the subdirectory mounting and um, also authentication for the clients, for, for example, using Kerberos. So people who actually know Luster and follow Luster developments and go to Luster uh, conferences, they know that actually these things are happening. Um, these projects already started and are being progressed. Um, so obviously, the meetings like that and the scientific working group helps to drive this. And you know, Intel is a big uh, contributor into Luster, so we work with Intel and we're trying to uh, make sure that this work is is, is progressing as well. Um, so uh, actually, in Cambridge we have something called CDI, which is the Cambridge Intel Solution Center, and uh, uh, what we do there is. We have a number of projects uh, that we uh, we develop and the solutions uh, for um, HPC, but not only. We work closely with um, um, Dell Austin Group, um, who is led by Onur, who is actually here. Um, and from our previous experience, there's a lot of good stuff coming out of that work. So we obviously decided to start also driving the OpenStack uh, project through that vehicle, and um, uh, Intel is one. Uh, ha they they have the the, the Intel Enterprise uh, Luster version, and they are uh, key contributor in, in Luster development. So we we're hoping that we will get traction in in um, making Luster more usable in in OpenStack environments. So. We may know that you know you can actually in AWS you can actually use already Luster. There's a, a something called Luster Cloud Edition, um, and if you if you spin up AWS um, instances, you can actually deploy uh, Luster in a few minutes on, on AWS. So uh, we would like to take that work and and uh, port that uh, functionality to 
open stack. So that you know, it's it's not it's, it's possible to do that now, uh, more or less manually, automatically. But it would be really good to 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 get that uh, uh, done with Intel and, and and make sure that this work is is. Uh, uh, well, well uh, the automation is, is, is done, um, and the last two is maybe added to the uh, application catalog, so it's very easy for everyone who's effectively a customer of, of us or user of OpenStack can actually uh, just launch the last file system straight away um, without having this uh, uh, special skills that you require to actually stand Luster up, because it's not, actually it's not easy. Um, so for, for to, to make that actually work, uh, you know, it's not difficult to spin up Luster and OpenStack, but to actually make it work uh, uh, in high performance mode, you need to have high performance storage uh, backend. So the work uh, I showed you earlier uh, um, is, is enabling that. So the ICER block storage uh, delivered by Cinder uh, can deliver that level of performance. So we'll be doing more benchmarks and tests, we'll publish them. Um, but some of the work we are done in the lab shows that there is actually clear and, and big benefit um, of, of uh, using uh, RDMA acceleration uh, for delivering storage to OpenStack. Um, so again, uh, I will re reiterate that uh, all this work will be documented and then published uh, as a white papers, but also through the OpenStack community and the scientific working group. So that's all from me and questions and there are also our emails if you'd like to contact us. The red one is for the boss. Never put my email on. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he never answers his emails. On I never way. answer my email, so <laughs> there's no point. Don't email me. Yes. Question. So your infrastructure, since you're partnering with Head, I assume it's based on implementing the computing power through virtual machines rather than containers? Currently, currently virtual machines, yes. yeah. Yes, so currently we're looking at, uh, because of the um, security and, uh, and, and the uh, isolation requirements from the, um, some of the projects in the hospital, uh, we at the moment, yes, we're looking at the more traditional cloud application using yeah. VMs and KVM. Yeah. And that's uh, been driven by that user community. So that particular user community, they're used to working in VMs. That, uh -oh. that it's easy for them. And that's actually the main driver is our customers say that that's, that's the way they access resources. And that they're already developing application uh, stacks and workflow stacks within a VM and then they share them. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I, I went to see the professor of medical informatics uh, a couple of weeks ago, Lydia Drumright, and she's like, where's your container yard? She actually s even uses containers. So these yeah. people are quite advanced in that way of working, uh, well, but currently we're just doing VMs. Well, I haven't mentioned before, actually, we, we uh, have a uh, small POC platform uh, for almost a year now, and we run a number of POCs with the uh, research groups in, in the hospital. So uh, they were very happy with that platform. That platform wasn't even RDMA accelerated. Um, but it, it, I think the reason they were happy was because of the, the flexibility that OpenStack gives them, that they can get their own resources, build their own infrastructures, so they just can get on with it and, and then wait for the IT department to, to do it. And it's very quick to, to change things. So I think that's one of the okay, key advantages using OpenStack is the flexibility you get. Uh, but obviously our, our work as a uh, central university Information Services Department is to make sure that we, we obviously provide a platform which is uh, flexible but also uh, provides these performance features. Okay, so my the second question regarding the, you have certain expectations from your customers, which is the department of the university. How do you handle the orchestration at the time delivering, you know, very fast power at the, t at the time of demand by that department? Is, do you have any special tools for orchestration? Yes, yeah, so, so in our traditional HPC environment, there's a you know a batch scheduling system and they put their jobs in the queue and uh, that we can give them priority or not dependent on uh, how much they pay because we run a cost center. Okay, so money is a great leveler. Okay, so those that have more money run faster in the queue. So uh, one of the one of the one of the advantages of the virtual machine model is we can over over prescribe, possibly get more instant access. So this is one of another driver actually for moving to a to a virtualized platform is we can give more instant on. 
because the traditional HPC certainly is not instant on. Really, you wait in the queue, and there can be gaps, and you can get in if you have a higher priority, but uh, this is one, one, of, one of the drivers, I think, is for that smaller workload having a more instant on with the ability to over-provision is something that uh, uh, is probably what you're getting at, right? And it, also, you know, in terms of the network orchestration, so, so um, we, we, Manox uh, provides a, a tool yeah. uh, called Neo to, to orchestrate the network, uh, driven by Neutron, so Neutron will drive that uh, software, and the software will actually talk to the switches and configure. I mean, it sounds good, but in practice, probably there is some bit of work to do to make it work well, which we will do. Uh, but also the key element is, uh, as I showed you in one of the slides, we had this very good fiber network. So uh, what we can do, I mean, uh, we can on demand provision um, access directly to a department via uh, our own devices, via own fibers, with very high performance throughput through that network. And it can be dedicated to specific research group or department. <coughs> so in that, in, the, in that respect, uh, we have this uh, almost, almost dynamic way of, of provisioning very fat pipes for, for the storage connections, and it's important for some of the groups as they produce a lot of data. And they traditionally, in the past, they were doing the, the compute on the, in their own place, but obviously, uh, as, as, as the research grows, they, 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 they have a big requirements for the facility. So the so natural way was to move to the data center. So our, our one of our key, uh, maybe not issues, but challenges is, is to make sure that we provide uh, these fat pipes to to departments so we can pull the data. And I think one of the res our responsibilities is as well to um, have the infra storage infrastructure in place, so not just high performance scratch or high performance uh, storage for, for computers, but the, all the multi -tier, multiple tiers of storage. So when scientists move data to us to compute and get the results, we don't want them to take, to, to need to take that data out they need to be able to store the data in the same place, because you know this is a big problem. I mean, we we had that we already have that problem because uh, previously we didn't have this multi-tiered storage uh, strategy, and a lot of complaints was about moving data out and in. And you, in a way, you shoot yourself in the foot because you know they put pushing data to your system and then have to take it out. So your system is always busy and always you always uh, fight you know with time. Um, so, yes, uh, we're moving to better time, hopefully, with the multi-tier strategy. Uh, your, um, your Next Center Edge platform, I don't, I don't know that much about the Next Center lineup at the moment, but uh, is that being used for volume storage or something? Is that yeah, so it's, 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 it's a new platform. So um, the Next Center released that last year, so we're kind of pioneering that with them. Um, we were using that for um, block storage initially, but also, but it can do both. It can do block and object. Um, so we'll be testing the object uh, function as well. Okay, and it, it's, a, it's a tier for the next cent for the next center store. The no, no, it's actually completely unrelated. Okay. Yeah, it's just uh, we just want to uh, evaluate this, this yeah. these different platforms because hardware. It gives it us block an object yeah. with a support ha cost that I can afford. Looking at hardware. Uh, infrastructure yeah. is all the same really, whether this is set uh, for Nexenta Edge, the hardware will, will look essentially similar. So so uh, Nexenta Edge, uh, the architecture is, is uh, promising a, a high performance uh, access to block and object. Mm. Uh, so there, there is a point here that the body hasn't mentioned. So we can have the Dell uh, storage hardware, and then we can differentiate that hardware one way to Luster one way to next center store and another way to next center edge. So just by kind of different software configuration, I can I can meet all the storage requirements that we need with one hardware platform and different yeah. storage pla uh, different software platforms that are all supported. Yeah. So so our our hardware um, fabric is is essentially uh, almost the same across all the systems, whether it's HPC or OpenStack. This is actually very important because uh, you know from the operational point of view, this is a headache for me to have multiple platforms from many vendors and, 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 and you know, provide efficient production services. It's okay for development, but if you actually okay. want to do production system, it's, 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 it's important. Uh, just wondering, uh, with this cloud, is the idea to, uh, I guess, uh, provision a cluster, uh, just uh, one, uh, one request at a time from a user or a group of users, or is it to uh, maybe for one team, you, you yeah, kind of so give them a cluster with a, a yeah, list so, of packets. So, so in, in this 
in our initial rollout, we, we have not virtualized or put OpenStack on the HPC cluster. We plan to do that, and what you're saying is exactly one of the goals. In, in this configuration, we've just provided in uh, virtual machines, not in a cluster configuration for that kind of single node, high throughput type workload right. for the kind of for that long tail that you might have heard people talking about. So, you know, I said that HPC has democratized, and there's now a large number of smaller users. Yeah. Those users will love the virtual machine. The traditional HPC in clustering, that will be our next stage, um, uh, similar to what the guys in Monash have done. You, you can deliver traditional HPC within OpenStack, where I could then spin up on demand, you know, either a virtual cluster, that's your cluster, I spin it up with your image, and then you run your scheduling environment within that cluster, and then I tear it down, and it goes back to someone else. Yeah. Yeah. There are various modes. That's next on the list. So, so we've, we've, so we've started simply for now. The infrastructure uh, enables that very well because we, we, we have the uh, RDMA accelerated uh, uh, storage. We have we uh, work on enabling SRIOV within the virtual instances. So from there, it's it's really working out the, the most efficient way, automatic yeah. way of spinning up the cluster. Which there are a number of, of projects out there that you can use and spin up a Slurm cluster yeah. within uh, it's OpenStack. It's technically feasible, but we need to but test is, it yeah. and then servitize it because we work in a central IT department and we've, we've learned by history and previous mistakes that we should only roll things out once we've really servitized them and, but and the we know the how they behave. So the that, that's future work. The infrastructure enables that to, to the point actually of, of, of architecting this infrastructure was to enable all these different functions, but with time. So we don't try to do all at the same time because this production system will be bringing that online in, in, in steps. Thank you. use uh, Ceph right now, you plan to use it on top of, uh, in addition to... Yeah, well, so there, there's one thing about Ceph, which is quite interesting, and Ceph looks very nice, and you go to Red Hat and you ask them, how much does that cost me to support a petabyte of Ceph? Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting discussion, because the cost model just scales, and you know, and when you scale it up to petabyte level, it's not economical. And so, uh, we're not using Ceph at Actually, the moment, we, because of the cost model. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we're actually using Ceph on the on the POC platform, yeah. uh, but uh, we're talking about production system here. So we've seen for the production system, we we uh, we rely on vendor support. So we go for yeah. for support all the components of the of the okay, system. So Ceph is not in the and that's in the, the cost no, related. The problem. cost model for support does not scale to the petabyte level. Okay, and the second question is: uh, Did you gather user requirements for bioinformatics workloads? Yeah, I see yeah. that you provide very fast uh, SSD-based uh, storage. You but can. So we, we, we that's support. That's what you have right now. So basically, you, you are building this for SSD based. Uh, we, we can do it that way or, or, or link it through to the to Lustre file system. So, so currently, we support some very large bioinformatics pipelines. And as long as we have a well maintained, a well engineered Lustre file system, that's fast enough. But the work we're doing with the uh, SSDs is, 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 has, that, has that in mind because it's more flexible and we can, we can load that up on demand. Okay. By the way, I'm running a three petabyte self cluster using bioinformatics mm -hmm. with uh, zero costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can talk after if you Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so obviously we, we, we could do Ceph uh, and have no commercial support. That, that's fine. And, uh, but for those once in a four year cycle problem, so we, we're used to running very large parallel file systems and it's all fine and you're happy, man, and life goes on. And then once every four years, you get that one problem with your file system where your engineer doesn't know how to fix it. We are not using Ceph in file system yeah. storage, object storage, so it depends so how you will yeah, yeah. store your data, um, the result in Ceph file. Uh, I mean yeah. we, we think Ceph is great, and, yeah. and, 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 and I think it just, you know, one of the, our key goals is to, because we work with Red Hat, to make Red Hat, you know, uh, It will come. I think the cost models Maybe they maybe introduce the Ceph in part as, as the infrastructure uh, they offer uh, in, the, in the license. Make make it most uh, more cost efficient, so so yeah. you know everyone can enjoy it in that you know s supported way. Uh, but yes, we we have got skills uh, in in house for Ceph, and we've been using Ceph on the POC platform. So yeah, we think it's actually great great system as well. Super. Uh, this is a slightly different question, Cambridge scale question. Mm -hmm. um, the network fabric that you talked about is that for research only, or is it for everything? So the so Cambridge own all the 
ducts that go all through all through the Cambridge metropolitan area. So that's um, it links up every building. So I guess my question is, do you compete with the IP firms? Um, the the IP firms have their own fibre, so we we can have okay. you know dedicated dark fibre. Should we just blow another so, fibre so through the tube? So we don't we don't. I may explain the the network in Cambridge. So. Uh, our team doesn't actually run the, the, the Cambridge network. Uh, so the, the network that connects all the departments and actually look after the fibers is different team. And and uh, we've got GBN, which is the, the network with the dark fibers, and we have CDN, which is Cambridge University Data Network, which actually makes the level, uh, L3 network. And that has the uh, phones and other things. Uh, so that network is, is used mostly for access like SSH and, you know, uh, websites. But if you really want to get a proper high performance access to your uh, HPC or to your OpenStack, then we would enable this fat pipe via the dark fibers. So we get that flexibility where we can basically almost to every department, every college, we can run a dark fiber and connect that directly to our systems in uh, whether L3 or L2. Mm. So, so, so there when Wojtek back backs stuff up to take the vice chancellor can still talk on the fact. Otherwise we'd have a problem. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. very much.